Coming up, do you remember back when LeBron quoted Martin Luther King, quote, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere, close quote, and quote, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter, close quote? I do. But LeBron's statements in the wake of the Hong Kong protests make me think that a modified line from Elton John's hit song, Leave On, fits LeBron James best. LeBron likes his money. He makes a lot, they say. Welcome back to Political Spirits. I'm your host, Franklin Rye. We still stand for the proposition that the left and the right should have a few drinks and talk. Compromise is not a requirement. If those discussions result in us changing or even abandoning our positions, that's fine. If they don't, that's fine too. We just need to talk to each other. In that way, we can unify through speech. And if the discussion becomes a bit heated, at the end of the night, we should still be able to split up the bar tab and be on our way. So what are we going to talk about this week? You remember the old saying, common in my youth, that what's good for General Motors is good for the country? Now, obviously, that saying was an oversimplification, but there was at least a grain of truth and probably more supporting it. It meant, of course, that government policies which benefit business benefit the country. I never really fully believed that, but I always thought and generally still think that it's a good idea to try to keep the interests of business in mind when considering government policies. That doesn't mean that those considerations should always control, but to my mind, it does mean that they should never be ignored. However, something has changed in the last few decades which calls that philosophy into question, for me, more so than in the past. And that change is globalism. Companies are so spread out around the world, even if they're American companies, that you can't assume better government policy which benefits them will benefit the American economy. So the old informal equation of offsetting benefits to the American economy against detriments against some individual Americans or possible detriments to tax revenue if the policy being considered was some sort of tax reduction or change in tax policy no longer applies. In some instances, and with some companies, there might actually be no benefit to the American economy. The assumption that American companies will hire in the U.S. was at one time true for the most part. Later it became true for the most part except when it came to low-skilled manufacturing positions. Then it became true for the most part except for manufacturing positions in general. But now it isn't true for a wide range of support positions even high-skilled and executive support positions, which may be moved offshore. Moreover, the world economy is so interconnected that much of what American politicians address deals with foreign companies, and there never was a saying that what's good for a Chinese company is good for America. Unfortunately, many of our politicians don't seem to understand that. When I first heard that while Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State, The Clinton Foundation received $145 million in donations from the investors involved in the Uranium One deal, which resulted in 20% of America's uranium reserves being transferred to a Russian-controlled enterprise. I was aghast. I assumed that the revelation would doom Hillary Clinton's political career, but it didn't. She still managed to get the Democratic nomination for president. And if she hadn't run what I would argue was a lazy and nearly incompetent presidential campaign, with excessive spending and an unnecessary geographic focus on areas she already had in the bag, she might have won. The idea of moneyed interest buying influence with politicians isn't new, of course. There's nothing new about corruption. But the fact that so much of it is now internationally based makes it seem that much worse. I know that sounds illogical, which is why I say it makes it seem that much worse. It just seems more corrupt when the conflict of interest is one where the benefit of purportedly buying the influence of the American politician doesn't even go to an American company. That's not to say that it's actually less corrupt for an American company to do that. 
It's just that it seems even more offensive when it's a foreign company. Think about the Uranium One scenario where the sale of uranium actually hurt the interests of America as a country, and Hillary Clinton didn't stop it when it went through the Cepheus process where, as Secretary of State, she could have stopped it. Think about Joe Biden's son, Hunter Biden. Think about the fact that Hunter Biden traveled with his father to China, and within less than two weeks, Hunter Biden's company, Rosemont Seneca Partners, was able to become a partner in a Chinese company, Bohai Harvest RST, BHR, which was backed by the Bank of China, an entity owned by the Chinese government. In short order, BHR was able to secure $1.5 billion in investments out of China, including China's Social Security Fund. BHR also became an anchor investor in China General Nuclear Power Company an entity owned by the Chinese government and involved in development of nuclear reactors. This is the same company, by the way, that in 2016 was charged with espionage by the United States Department of Justice for theft of United States nuclear secrets. See the New York Post October 10 edition in an article by Peter Schweitzer and Jacob McLeod entitled Six Facts About Hunter Biden's Business Dealings in China. Does this concern me? You bet it does. As you can probably tell from prior episodes of this podcast, I'm generally quite supportive of President Trump. I intend to vote for him actually probably more enthusiastically than I did in 2016. But my son asked me a few weeks ago if I absolutely had no choice but to vote for one of the Democratic candidates for president, who would it be? I told him flat out that I wouldn't want to vote for any of them, but if I absolutely had to vote for one of them, I suppose it might be Joe Biden. I figured of all the Democrats up there, he might do the least damage, but that's no longer the case. If I had to vote for a Democrat, and once again I have no intention of doing so, I will enthusiastically vote for President Trump, but if I had to vote for one of the Democrats, I can no longer even consider Joe Biden. Because I sit back and I look at the way he describes China, as if it isn't a real threat, the way he mocks those who describe China as a threat to the U.S. And then I think about the extent to which his son Hunter Biden has profited from China, and I think it's corruption at its most fundamental. I think Joe Biden was for sale. And I wish it was only Joe Biden, but I don't have confidence that's the case. There is no way I would ever want Joe Biden in the presidency. So is China the only foreign country from which Hunter Biden was being paid? Unfortunately, no. Does anybody really believe that the largest private Ukrainian gas company, Burisma, was paying Hunter Biden $50,000 to $83,000 a month to be on his board of directors for his expertise? Hunter Biden had no experience in the oil and gas industry. And other than being the son of the vice president of the United States, he was most famous for having a serious drug problem. Does anybody really believe that Hunter Biden received that job for any other reason than the fact that his father was vice president? Especially given that he received the job right after his father was assigned to oversee relations with the Ukraine and address their corruption problem. Does anybody really believe that, especially given that the company on whose board Hunter Biden sat was one with a reputation for corruption, and as I discussed on a prior episode, was still under investigation for that corruption? Under those circumstances, it's nothing less than stunning that much of the media has no interest in talking about it, much less investigating it. Incidentally, when Anderson Cooper finally asked Joe Biden about his son's position on the board of Burisma, he introduced it this way, quote, Mr. Vice President, President Trump has falsely accused your son of doing something wrong in Ukraine. I want to point out that there is no evidence of wrongdoing by either one of you, close quote. Really? That's the way a purported journalist introduces a question to a candidate for the presidential nomination of a major political party, stating that the claims of the candidate's opponents are false and that there's no evidence of wrongdoing. 
So that qualifies as journalism? That isn't journalism, that's a joke, and a bad one at that, being played on the American people. CNN long ago gave up any right to claim it's a legitimate journalistic enterprise when it comes to anything involving President Trump. The undercover videos that have now started to be released in the last week from Project Veritas show that. If CNN would acknowledge that when it comes to President Trump, it's all political commentary and opinion all the time, then I would have more respect for him. But they don't. They still claim to be reporters, not just commentators. As the Project Veritas videos show, they are commentators obsessed with providing nearly endless commentary on the purported impeachment investigation, virtually to the exclusion of everything else. But even with that background, it doesn't quite explain the absurdity of Anderson Cooper basically providing Joe Biden's response to the claim of corruption when asking the question. I frankly don't see how Anderson Cooper wasn't embarrassed by the way he asked the question. And remember, last week I sang a parody version of the SpongeBob theme song, so I'm quite familiar with the concept of embarrassment. Next topic. Not those others. Let's talk for a moment about LeBron James' criticism of Houston Rockets general manager Daryl Morey for tweeting support for Hong Kong protesters. Morey tweeted, quote, fight for freedom, stand with Hong Kong, close quote. After the government of China went virtually apoplectic in response, LeBron James said of Morey's tweet, quote, yes, we all have freedom of speech, but at times there are ramifications for the negative that can happen when you're not thinking about others and you're only thinking about yourself, close quote. Really, LeBron? So Daryl Morey was thinking about himself rather than others when he tweeted support for the Hong Kong protesters? I'm a bit confused here. Does LeBron think that Daryl Morey is himself a Hong Kong protester? Daryl Morey's tweet was clear. He expressed support for the Hong Kong protesters, he doesn't hold an investment in the Hong Kong protests. On its face, the tweet would indicate that he's thinking about those protesters. He's thinking about their lives and their ability to live in freedom. So it's clear that Maury was thinking about others. So how could LeBron have thought that Maury wasn't thinking about others? Well, I can only think of one way. And that way is that LeBron meant Maury wasn't thinking about the right others. For one, he wasn't thinking about LeBron James. Maury wasn't thinking about how his tweet could harm the financial interests of a basketball player worth nearly half a billion dollars, with a multi-million dollar relationship with a shoe company, Nike, with a multi-billion dollar market in China. Perhaps LeBron meant that Maury wasn't thinking of the other millionaire basketball players, many of which have their own financial relationships with shoe and apparel companies with large markets in China. Perhaps LeBron meant that Maury wasn't thinking of the billionaire owners of NBA teams with large markets in China. But any way you slice it, it seems that what LeBron was saying was that rather than expressing support for the millions of ordinary Hong Kong citizens worried about maintaining their freedoms and protecting their future, Daryl Morey should have been suppressing any such supportive comments for those understandably worried Hong Kong citizens and instead have thought about protecting millionaires and billionaires wanting to avoid upsetting Chinese Communist Party leaders. This, by the way, is the same LeBron James who has tried to portray himself as a champion of the underdog, of the oppressed. Think back, for example, to his wearing the I Can't Breathe t-shirt in reference to Eric Garner, the African-American New Yorker who died with an officer's arm clutching his neck during an arrest for selling loose cigarettes. After receiving quite a bit of backlash on social media and from some political commentators and also political figures, primarily on the right, LeBron ended up saying that, quote, he won't be talking about it again, close quote, that, quote, we're not politicians, close quote, and it's a, quote, 
huge political thing, close quote. So after chastising Daryl Morey when he chose to speak his mind on the issue, on receiving backlash, LeBron concluded that silence was the right approach. It seems LeBron has pretty dramatically changed his views on speaking publicly about sensitive social issues, at least when it comes to China. Do you remember back when LeBron quoted Martin Luther King, quote, Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere, close quote, and quote, Our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter, close quote? I do. But LeBron's statements in the wake of the Hong Kong protests make me think that a modified line from Elton John's hit song, Leave On, fits LeBron James best. LeBron likes his money. He makes a lot, they say. Well, I like my listeners, and I'll be giving you plenty to listen to. I'll be back next week. Hopefully, you'll join me. In the interim, be sure to tell your friends about Political Spirits and like the podcast on Facebook at Political Spirits. And follow me and the podcast on Twitter at Franklin Rye. And remember, all episodes are now on YouTube as well. And the YouTube channel is named Political Spirits Network. Thanks to all of you for being a part of Political Spirits. This is Franklin Rye. Thank you for listening.